Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another exciting virtual tour with Pretty Gritty Tours. I'm your guide this evening, Chris, and welcome to our virtual tour of Chambers Bay, the drain of the Puget Sound. <laughs> this indentation in the earth has served many uses after a glacial ice shelf left all its spare change in the pocket of the earth. This has been the savior of a people's, the site of an armed international conflict, a major industrial site, and the source and home of the U.S. Open back in 2015. So many different hats for a single 1,000 acre plot of land out here that consistently gets overlooked. It's also, just side note, one of the best spots to go jogging in the area. Tonight, we're simply going to answer the question, how could it possibly be all of these things all at once? Well, I'm glad you asked. Join me now for this exciting experience. Because it is a live virtual tour, please feel free to comment, give questions, join us as we go along. And uh, yeah, it looks like, man, we got some Tucson. Welcome in. Good to see you all tonight. Always a pleasure. Glad to have Puyallup representing. All right, let's do this, my friends. Chambers Bay. Oh, so we gotta go way, 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 way back for this one. First of all, if you are not familiar with Chambers Bay, it sits in between Tacoma and Stillicum. This is facing south from about 200 feet up in the air. Uh, you can see Anderson Island right out there in the Puget Sound, Stillicum nestled against the shoreline there. And then, of course, the iconic golf course that represents the largest portion of Chambers Bay right down there. Um, but to understand the area, we're, we're going to go back in time memoriam. So currently today, Chambers Creek Regional Park is the official title. It is 930 acres nestled right down there along the southern Puget Sound, and it is a part of Pierce County. So much so that Pierce County actually owns the 930 acres and their ownership of this huge tract of land is shockingly relatively recent. Um, it's, it's taken shape to the way we see it really just over the last couple decades. It has taken its shape to become the place that it is over thousands of years. It is, I think, most famous as being a gravel pit. And conservative estimates put it at 90% of the entire city of Seattle is built on top of this gravel uh, quarried right here from Chambers Bay. So a little bit of a <laughs> well done, Pierce County. Well done. Giving Seattle its fame and glory as always. Not that I'm bitter, but <laughs> uh, today, if you go down there, I believe there are two miles of accessible beachfront shoreline right down there. Uh, the the main railroad track does intersect right across that, but the Chambers Bay area has done a really good job of providing bridges overneath. Overneath, good lord over the top of the train track so that you can access that beach front down there. And to give you guys a quick little look at what the area looks like, I want to give you this beautiful eye-catching number that was provided by a golf company to represent the Chambers Bay golf course, but I think does a nice overview aerially of the area.
Well done, Envisage. You never really realize just how intense apparently the game of golf is until you see a high production film firm put that in the crosshairs for you. So yeah, that gives you a really beautiful image of the Chambers Bay area in its current current form, but I think the phoenix of this area has risen from the ashes on more than one occasion. The, the oldest standing residents of the area would be the Stilicum tribe. And to give you a little bit of backstory on that, uh, I've got some cool photos here for you of the Stilicum's time out there. So the Stilicum Indian tribe still continues to exist and reside in the area, not specifically on chambers, uh, but they are near their ancestral homeland out here. And they are one of many groups that were in the Salish speaking area. And to give you a better representation of their story, I'm going to have um, one of them introduce it to you. Traditional story for the Stilicum tribe is that that, that was a very large mountain peak there, the highest place you could see uh, from anywhere. Danny Marshall is the chair of the Stilicum Indian Tribal Council, an elected nine-member body charged with governing their people and preserving their heritage. In the history of our tribe, we have a story about how uh, we survived the great flood in the world by tying a canoe to the top of that peak. For as long as anyone can remember, the Stilicum tribe has been made up of five related bands of Native Americans, the Stilicums, the Sastuck, the Spanaway, the Tlithlo, and the Sigualichu, around 600 people who spoke a sub-dialect of the Puget Sound Salish language, made their homes and their living around Chambers Creek, or as they knew it, Stilicum Creek. There were two main things, uh, gathering food, for survival and also protecting yourself from raids from outside of the area. The tribes around in this area were very peaceful and, and interactive with each other uh, because they knew that building relationships was the way to gain power. And when the first European ships sailed through what would become Puget Sound in 1792, most resident tribes expected to build relationships with these newcomers as well. The Hudson's Bay Company soon established trading posts along the Sound, which led to the inevitable surge in the non-Indian population. Among those early... So, that gives you a little bit of backstory there. And to corroborate the origin story, you can look at the geological clues as well. Because going back quite a ways, when the glacial shelf was on top of the Puget Sound, this is a very noisy map, but it gives you a good idea. Everything in blue here was at one time glacier on top of the shoreline of Puget Sound. And it left behind quite a few souvenirs. Uh, there's Bellingham for you. I don't know why that's important. But uh, you can see that the glacier extended all the way around the southern Puget Sound here and the Puget Sound in its entirety. And as it retreated over time, it left behind gravel and this hill. Now the hill became important to the Stilicum tribe, and then the gravel became important to everybody else. Enter the next star of our story, the Hudson Bay Company. They establish a trading post down at the southern portion of this area here, start making orchards, uh, really getting into the fur trade there, and then they more or less abandon it, but say, hey, um, seat, seat tabs. And everyone's like, okay, I guess this is the Hudson Bay Company until, of course, some people moved in under the U.S.'s arrangement. And they're like, oh, you know what? Seat Jack, we're going to take this right here. So the first guy to really officially uh, put his name on everything is how we're going to say this is Mr. Thomas Chambers, pictured stunningly here. Uh, he was from Ireland originally. He started, and you can chart his vocational growth here. He started as a Presbyterian minister who married a cousin of Andrew Jackson and then traveled to America in 1816. What a crazy origin story. Uh, he tries out cotton, uh, cotton plantation for a little while, not really his style. So he's like, you know what? Let's go west. And he follows a series of donation claims and by, I think, 1840s, he ends up in the area that we now call Chambers Creek and sets up his land claim out there, builds a little cabin, and then has an outpost there until 
the Hudson Bay Company wants their land back. So this whole area is in dispute. The Stilicum are like, pretty sure this is ours. Uh, Chambers is like, absolutely not. This is mine. And then the Hudson Bay Company rolls in a whole little platoon down here. And they're like, by the way, give it back. And the official story is that Mr. Thomas Chambers here went out uh, with his sons, stood behind his like picket fence in front of his cabin with a loaded shotgun and just refused to give it back. And so all these soldiers with the Hudson Bay Company had to make the decision then and there. Are they going to start an international war with the United States to take back this creek? Or are they going to let one guy with a shotgun run them out of town? And now, now you know, Thomas Chambers successfully defends now U.S. soil from the British Empire, giving us the area as we have it today. He puts his name on it, I guess rightfully so at that point, and calls it Chambers Creek. And this is the area that we start calling Chambers Bay, Chambers Creek, and so on. And he was hugely famous and prominent in the area, not only for sending the British packing, but then he establishes a grist mill. This is not his grist mill. This is just for uh, you to envision what his looked like. It wasn't too different from this one. This is actually the Cedar Creek grist mill just uh, in Woodland, Washington, sort of outside Vancouver. But Chambers then takes on all these new roles. Uh, he becomes, I think, the justice of the peace for a period of time, then the county commissioner of Lewis County, and then eventually, in, I think, 1850, he starts a business empire expansion until eventually he becomes Judge Chambers and becomes the main judge of the area. And so well-loved was this guy that there's this story that when someone else showed up at the train station wearing a top hat, a buddy of Chambers, I don't even know if they were friends, someone who knew Chambers, ran up to him, knocked the top hat off, and was like, nobody dresses nice except the Honorable Judge Chambers. And that was the kind of reputation this guy had. Don't wear a top hat around because it will get knocked right off your head. Um, this is of the Chambers Bay area in the late 1800s as the train starts rolling through. And then eventually in 1876, uh, Chambers dies of old age and is buried with like a full regalia in the local Masonic Cemetery, which if you're curious is just outside of Lakewood proper as the Stilica Masonic Cemetery. And you can still find the final resting place of Judge the Honorable Thomas Chambers right outside of town there. Uh, so this is the first time that like infrastructure and development really gets jotted down and taken note of in that area. And this gives us the beginning of Chambers Bay as we'll see it from here on out. Because now that Chambers has developed the area, they've noticed that there is something that everyone suddenly wants to get their hands on, and it is gravel. The finest glacial gravel that people have seen on the West Coast, and then eventually the country. It's, I'm almost gonna say supernaturally um, hard, like it's just pure glacial gravel and people are go bananas for it because it's so strong. It's the proper size and you can just quarry it right out of the earth and then use it for concrete, um, milling down to cement or again for building the foundation of a city, i.e. Seattle. Uh, Stilicum, Tacoma and Seattle all end up being built on the foundation of this incredible gravel. But the contract that really sets them off is the U.S. military, like so much in this area, right? So this is the site today. Uh, you can see sort of like a hammer, the vast majority of the Chambers Creek sort of recreational area here owned by Pierce County is right here along that shoreline there. And it comprises a park, the golf course, several trails for walking, jogging, a playground, then also a wastewater treatment plant, and then the majority of the creek, Chambers Creek itself, and its riparian zone up along there. And the thinking that Pierce County had on buying that riparian zone was that you're going to have better quality water if you are the steward of the area. 
So they they go about their their plan of making this a clean and safe area by essentially buying the areas around it and trying to preserve them as wetlands. Now, we had a really good uh, question here. What the heck is grist and why do you mill it? Uh, it's a type of grain. So they were harvesting this grain out here and then you put it on essentially two giant stone wheels. And then in the case of chambers, uh, it was a water mill. And so the flow of the water would cause these stones to spin and grind that grain down into a fine flour. And then you can use it for bread or whatever you want. See, I'm glad I could uh, at least answer one question accurately tonight. Although watch someone be like, Grist, in fact, is doing my best here, guys. So this is the, the Chambers Creek property as it is, and you can see that it has not only been a major industrial site from the dawn of, of settling out here, but also a site that people have just thought fondly of as sort of a recreational and beautiful area, Chambers Creek in particular. You can find this is from 1898, and it's a postcard that was sent home. Uh, and it's almost impossible to read. For those of you who can still read script, you can translate for the rest of us, but it says, I believe, Dearest Aunt Jessie, Papa just telephoned up today. Something illegible. Amy had just something illegible. The doctors had given up all hope of Mildred, who lives back of you, living over 24 hours. We have no particulars. This is all he said. If anything happens, we'll let you know. With love and kisses for your birthday, lovingly, DK. Whew. Really good stuff. I think Netflix is going to pick this up later. Uh, there are actually quite a few postcards from the Chambers Creek area, all sort of a similar vein, just information being sent back home to the family. Uh, one of the really pretty ones that I found is this one. I think this is from 1910 that these postcards were circulating out in the area. And you can see when you look at the, the riparian zone and the creek out there, it's a beautiful area. There's actually a couple parks down on the creek itself. And then this is Chambers Creek, which does still have salmon that spawn home up it. Now, if you're looking at a, a timeline of the development of this area here, the 1850s is when the US military starts grabbing up that gravel. And the thing that they're interested in is actually the development of the, the Triangle of Fire, uh, Fort Flagger, Fort Casey, and Fort Warden up at the mouth of the Puget Sound, that choke point up there. And so the majority of those structures are also made with this pure glacial gravel that comes from the Stilicum area, in particular, Chambers Bay. From that point, it changes hands multiple times, but more or less always as a gravel mine, a gravel company. Uh, the name changes, but the game stays the same. Until eventually it's in the early 2000s that you see more environmental services coming out there. There are playgrounds and ball fields. Uh, the Grandview Soundview trails end up out there. It's 2007, and this is bananas to me, 2007 that the Chambers Bay Golf Course officially opens. And then in 2015, they do the last sprucing up because it's finally time for them to host the U.S. Open. And when they designed this golf course early on, before anything had been done to it, they're like, we will host the U.S. Open. And that agreement had been struck before the golf course had even been built in 2007. The plan, like it was destined to be the home of the U.S. Open long before anything. After Chambers, the Honorable Judge Chambers starts his grist mill there, the first sort of major production you see in the area is uh, 1850s with timber. Uh, and this is a picture from that time period in the early 1900s when it was still timber production. But they would essentially mill those old growth trees and then dump them into the Chambers Creek there hold them for processing at the mill or send them out into the Puget Sound where they could be barged up and shipped wherever they needed to go. This is the first real picture that I've been able to locate online of major gravel production down at Chambers Bay. And you can see here the, the remnants of a lot of these structures that you encounter today. So if you are to go, let's see if I can bring it up for you guys again really quick. 
if you go down to the Chambers Bay area today and do the walk around it or play golf or anything, you'll see a lot of these, they call them the ruins. The ruins down there are the remnants of the old gravel production facility that they had down there. And it just was too expensive to tear them out. So the design was kind of built around it to have that really stunning architectural flair in the middle of this city park and golf course. And let's see if I can give you guys another one here. This is another one of that gravel production going on down there. And it's a little bit closer so you can kind of see everything that's going on down there. Another thing that you'll see in the photos that I want you to be able to get a good look at is this. And this is amazing to me. So they established this mobile office, put it on wheels, and then had a train track that ran parallel to the hillside. And I don't know if you can see it, but at the base of that building, there is a large steam scoop and it runs up a mobile wire towards the, the structure that's at the top of the hill there. And this is used for scraping and excavating gravel from the main wall of the hill there. And then as it comes down, they would use a, a essentially like a front loader or an excavator, steam powdered, to scoop it up and then put it on the track. And you can see when we zoom back out here that it just ran along the back end of the gravel quarry there. It could just move back and forth across the train track, scraping gravel off the side, and then they would use the steam loader to bring it up and then uh, separate it by size or crush it down for its various uses in the main facility that's right along the waterfront there. And it's also interesting to see that the uh, Northern Pacific Railroad had already staked their claim there. So everything that's ever happened here from Thomas Chambers onward has had to just deal with the railroad being right in the middle of their operations forever and always. Uh, along the creek, a little bit south of there, the next major production that came in was actually a paper mill in the 1940s. Uh, and this is, let's see, paper manufacturers for West Tacoma newsprint. And they did the majority of their own um, newspaper paper milling right down here on the waterfront, just south of the Chambers Bay Recreational Area today. And this is them doing their major paper mill. So Tacoma has had, in its history, more than one paper mill contributing to that fantastic and now infamous Tacoma aroma. This is, again, Chambers as you would see it today and then directly overlaid to Chambers as you would have seen it in 1963. And at this point, it was the pioneer sand and gravel company operating out of the area. And you can see just beyond the pretty gritty logo up there, Mount Rainier standing sentinel over all of it. You can actually see the McCord airfield down there as well. It's a pretty incredible aerial shot at the time. Uh, this is from the south end of the Chambers area looking north, and you can see it in its full um, operation as a golf course and center there. But it's not the only thing that it does. They also offer a huge amount of recreational activities. You'll see a ton of people practicing paragliding or windsurfing down there, as well as all sorts of kites flying on any given day. And in 2011, the sort of recreational facilities were really expanded and they created a whole uh, genre of things for the Parks and Rec Department to do. So they coordinated quite a few things out there from the playground to the dog park to the open field. And this is just one of the things that has happened out there. Anyone who's been to the Chambers Bay area is familiar with the Lovelock Bridge. Uh, this particular bridge extends from the main play field out over the rail line and then down to the waterfront so you can get beach access. And people madly in love will go confess their truest feelings, lock one of these locks on the wire there and their love will last as long as the lock will, or, or so they say. <laughs> um, the bad news for these would-be lovers, unfortunately, is that the weight of this becomes too heavy for the bridge, the way it was engineered. And so regularly, Parks and Rec has to go out there and hacksaw them all off. I don't know. They might use an angle grinder. I haven't confirmed it. But I'm going to hope that the relationships continue to go 
for that for that time out there. Oh man, we got some good stuff out here about the paper mill. Yeah, the original aroma of Tacoma. And to be fair, just just as a side note for everyone here, the Tacoma aroma has been many things over time. The original aroma of Tacoma. Uh, was the stink eye that Seattle cast down upon us as we got all the money and power for being the terminus of the railroad. And then after that, it was the massive industrial pollution that went into the Puget Sound. The paper mill was just something that came in the epilogue of this whole thing. And honestly, now it's just the myth that we use to uh, keep urbanites from developing the area. It's more or less effective. It depends on the time of the month. The, the next major industrial development out there actually happened in 1984 when Lone Star Northwest Gravel Mine uh, had part of their lease snatched up by a sewer utility facility that purchased the area. And they had, a, I think, a 650-acre purchase. Uh, and that's what really triggered the creation of the Chambers Creek Public Works and Properties site. And this has been a massive and award-winning wastewater treatment facility for a long time. Uh, this is what it looks like today. It does both disposal of liquids and solids, and they clean and process everything and then re-release clean water back into the Puget Sound. So these are, these are the major, major players we've got here. We've got a wastewater treatment facility, a massive city park, a major... A uh, golf course that's once hosted the U.S. Open and is still the stuff of nightmares for many players. Uh, there is public beachfront and access down there, a salmon spawning creek and dam. There's all sorts of stuff going on in a single area there, as well as several trails for jogging, running, and general fitness. From here, you can look out and sort of focus on the golf course for a second because it like I said, was built with the intention of hosting the U.S. Open, uh, completed in 2007, and then has all of this greenery to it. And the grass, this yellow grass, is something that's pretty unique and specific to both the area and Chambers. And to give you a little more insight on that, um, the, the Chambers Bay Golf Commission has this one that kind of gives some of the features that are unique about this as a golf course for those of you who are interested in that. Now the big thing about the trains is they're part of everyday play here at Chambers Bay. There, there are uh, 52 north and 52 southbound trains uh, from BNSF standpoint running through here and six Amtrak trains running through here each day. Uh, we never really thought about eliminating the trains. We want them to run just as they do on a normal basis. Um, they're a part of the golf course every day for everyday players and we want them to be a part of the U.S. Open and, uh, you know, I, players when they know something's coming um, won't be as, as bothered as, as it's southern, it's sudden sounds for them. It's, uh, you know, something falling or those sudden sounds. If they know a train's coming, uh, they may take, take off, take a step off, and, but while that train's coming, they'll continue to play and, and we, think it's, uh, we think it's a very unique aspect and we want it to be a part of the U.S. Open. The challenges fescue uh, poses, uh, first off from a rough standpoint, you can see how unpredictable it is. You can see how there are seed heads that pop up like this. You can see how some areas it starts getting laid down when it gets long. And um, so it's a very, you know, it's not a very uh, consistent grass when it, come, when it gets very tall. This fescue grass, when it's mowed tightly, when it's a half inch on some of the run-ups and things like that, there'll be a lot of players that won't hit uh, sand wedges. They, you can't really hit great flop shots out of here, particularly when it gets dry and firm and fast. You're going to see people from 100 yards out putt. You'll probably see a 100 yards, 100 yard putt out here off the front of the green. You're going to see people hit three woods, rescue clubs, eight irons, pitching wedges. So it's not a, a course where you just hit it as far as you can and then, then hit a wedge onto the green. Um, it's more about using your imagination and keeping the ball low a lot of times particularly if the wind's blowing, things like that. But managing all the undulations on the greens and then in the fairways, I think will be key out here. We're standing here on the 15th tee, a very uh, iconic hole at, at Chambers Bay, the golf course only being seven or eight years old. Obviously the lawn fur in the background gets a lot of attention. It's photographed, it's uh, famous in its own right. But uh, really what's gonna make this hole unique uh, during the championship is the fact that uh, it's gonna 
probably provide the biggest range in yardages that we have on this golf course. We've got a, a uh, back tee that plays 246 yards here onto 15, and then we've got a front tee that's going to play 100 yards less than that at about 140. So talking about the uh, differences and what makes this course special and what makes it unique is the fact that we can change different holes based on the wind, the weather, the hole locations, and, and no better example than the 15th hole. The ninth hole is a par three. Um, traditionally, the ninth hole is played as a downhill par three. It's about a 90 yard um, elevation drop from the tee. Uh, the back tee on the top is 224 yards to a heavily undulated green. Really unique. We've never really had that much of a difference in, uh, in teeing locations, particularly where one hole plays straight downhill and one hole plays a bit uphill. So nine is a fantastic opportunity to identify the best players, you know, that's what we're ultimately after. This has a lot of nicknames, whether you ask a caddy or whoever you ask, but I think Chambers Basement is probably the one I hear most often. And this is a very common design element in Scottish link style golf courses. Um, a lot of uh, fairway bunkers, a lot of them hidden. Um, you can't see them from, uh, which this one is. If you've never played the golf course, if you're back in the fairway, you can't see this bunker. It, I think it's a really great design element and uh, you know I think uh, it's a curi curiosity for folks that uh, that don't know what's here. I think you'll see a lot of professionals in the practice rounds just coming down here and and trying to see what they can do hitting the hitting the shot out of here. So there you go. Yeah. I'm always glad when I see that that he managed to get it out right away. And I'm I'm hoping that was the first take, but magic of cinema, my friends. So fescue. Fescue is a fun word and a cool grass, and it is specifically chosen for the Chambers area, not just because it presents a challenge for golfers, but it is a endemic and drought resistant grass that is very well suited for the area. And to further enhance its uh, sort of green aspect, ironically, because it's generally a brown grass, uh, they water it with reclaimed water from the wastewater treatment plant right next door and fertilize it with processed sewage from the very same plant. So it is a one-stop shop down there at Chambers Bay. They're using everything processed from the wastewater treatment facility to then fertilize and irrigate the golf course itself. Really um, fascinating and I think very forward-thinking stuff. So let me take you to what I'm really excited about gravel because i've given you the overview but i really want you to see the gravel facility there because chambers is beautiful it's incredible to walk but trying to envision it as the gravel facility that it used to be is so cool so this is of early gravel production these photos are from the pierce county uh, website and you can see right there on the side the major um, train track coming through and then the gravel production facility right in the middle. And these are a major part of the, the ruins that you see down there today. And so it used to be in the gravel industry, wherever my rock nerds are, that they would call stuff silicone grade aggregate. Uh, and that was just the best in the region, the most highly sought after extreme quality, extreme hardness gravel. And it became the, the gravel of the land. Uh, they said that there was nothing significant built in this country that doesn't begin with a rock and the Chambers Bay course is no different. So the aggregates in this industry are doing incredibly well in the area. And that was seen as like sort of the, the bellwether to indicate how the economy would be doing in the area. Absolutely fascinating to me that so much of the economy was really not only built on, but literally built on the rock out here. So the two major players were here with the silicone grade gravel and uh, just just east of there, Ilkeson with the one of the few examples of naturally waterproof sandstone, which is quarried from the Wilkeson area. And I hope to be doing a Wilkeson tour here soon, A, because the small town of Wilkeson is amazing, but also the, the stone quarry out there is responsible for so many of the majestic and historic structures that we have in Tacoma and beyond today. But you can see here uh, a couple shots side by side, 
And this gives you a little bit better too. On the left hand photo, those are the pillars that you see down there today. Uh, when you're walking around down there, there's like a structure that I think even has an osprey pear nesting in it most recently. Uh, and those just held the large stacks of gravel there that would roll up on that platform. On the right hand photo, you can see that structure I was talking about that like pseudo house that they made uh, with the office inside and had the long wire that extended up the hill. And you can see their steam shovel uh, scooping from the top down towards the building there where they would load it up with a front loader or onto one of their mobile tracks and take it out. And then here you get a better view of sort of just how expansive the gravel operation really was. Uh, and a really clear image of those large concrete walls that you see out there today. Uh, when you're walking around on the northern portion of Chambers Bay, there's those like almost diamond shaped uh, concurrent concrete walls out there. And you can see they were essentially to separate the different qualities of gravel out there. The thing that you will not see out there anywhere today are these massive structures up on the scaffolding right in the center of that photo there. There's the, the remnants as they are today. So you can see the pillars right off there, center left, and then those massive um, concrete separators right there on the bottom. And I'll flip back to the historic photo here really quick for a second so you can get in a reference point and then back. Really just extraordinary stuff. These are the ruins as they are today. Uh, they're part of both the golf course and the recreational play field. So you get a little access to both. And then the walking, running stroller trails, depending on how fit you wanna be, because there are some steep inclines and declines out there. Uh, make sure your baby is tethered to you before you go running with your stroller. This area, weaves throughout the golf course. So you go up and down throughout the links as you're on the trail out there. This kind of gives you an idea of the area as it was when it was a um, just an open gravel pit and then what they turned it into as the golf course. And you can see the trails a little better from the satellite image here. What I think was so fascinating about this is that when the decision was made to turn this into a golf course after Lone Star Gravel Company's lease ran out, they're like, it's perfect because it's already sand. Like we can terraform it and shape it however we want. Uh, the sand is already there and nothing really has to be added to it, just this grass. And so they use the, the viscue grass to give it that, that traditional Scottish feel. Now, I think the thing that everybody wants to know about when they're at Chambers Bay is what the heck is this tunnel and how deep in the earth does it go? And my initial research when I was looking at it was very misleading because there is a project called the Chambers Creek Tunnel Program, which has images like this. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, my life is about to change forever. But these are actually three shafts, uh, 12 feet in diameter and then 130 feet deep uh, with a sprayed concrete exterior that's, I think, six inches thick. And then the three of them go, like I said, 130 feet down into the earth and then merge into a combined sewer line that provides sewage to the wastewater treatment facility. So don't be fooled. This tunnel has nothing to do with these. I don't want your heart to break like mine once did. Uh, this is access from the old gravel production facility. It's mostly used for storage of things for Pierce County's uh, sort of parks and rec department today, as well as the golf course down there. But there's a historic photo of the gravel sorting line right here uh, where essentially they would go through and sort of put it on these rollers to both move it throughout, but also separate it into the various grades of gravel that it would be used later on. This is sort of mid range uh, through the history of the gravel production facility there. You can see a great deal of the scaffolding had already been established. And I can zoom in really quick for you here 
to give you a better look at that infrastructure out there with those concrete sorting chambers, as well as the main pillars that you see for the ruins down there, which again, look like this. Uh, when Lone Star's lease ran out, all of this scaffolding came down. Mostly the, the steel structures that they made for gravel sorting were deemed too dangerous to just have left out in the area there. So they got rid of them. But they were responsible, and it looks like a theme park out there. I love this photo. Uh, for transporting all of the gravel to Pioneer 17, which was the main barge. There were a few pioneers out there. But these barges would get loaded up from a hopper and then ship that gravel north to facilities, primarily in Seattle, or they would get on larger ships in the Tacoma area and then disembark from there. And you can see, I think this is from the 1980s. Uh, Lone Star officially shut down its gravel operations in the 1990s. But you can see the large uh, sort of catch-all water pool out there, as well as all of the scotch broom that was already growing out in the area there. And you can see that their gravel operation had really wound down. They had excavated tremendous volumes of gravel over almost a hundred years, actually by that point, a hundred years, and it was winnowing itself down. And the way that they would do it, this is a close-up shot of that chain operated steam shovel that they could hoist to the top of the hill and then essentially just let it drag down as they pulled it back home to that mobile office and then dump all of that into a front loader from there. Here's another aerial shot of the timber industry there, but I wanted you to be able to see up over the hill again to where the gravel operation had already taken out a huge swath of that area and moved it down. And then it took them just 10 short years to turn it into this lush, green, very coveted open spot where the US Open would one day be hosted. But before that, it was just barges, and tugboats out of Seattle and Tacoma taking gravel down through these. This was a specialty retaining wall made with uh, concrete from the area. And they designed it with this S shape for holding raw materials. And they were like 190 feet long. I think another one was actually 400 feet long. But uh, they made this S curve to provide additional strength to it because they found that with the tremendous volume of gravel and just the weight of all that material that they were moving around, if they had just a straight retaining wall, it would crumple. It would just break anytime they tried to put stuff in there. Here's just another great shot of, I'm trying to think when this was taken specifically. Uh, this was during the days when they were making true mix concrete out of the gravel in the area there. So it had to have been at least the 1950s with Pioneer Sand and Gravel Company operating at the time. And then before that, this would have been in the 1930s, I believe, when they were still barging everything out in these old school barges that always look to me like they're just one, one moment away from tipping over. Like look at the, the bow end of Pioneer 17 here, already dipping into the water. And I can't even imagine how much weight all this gravel is. Here's another quick shot from the interior of that concrete facility there. Uh, this is again with the Pioneer Sand and Gravel Company. And this was getting ready to load up Pioneer Barge number 17 again. And what they were doing here is again, separating the size. And so it would feed out of these hoppers down to that sorting line that I, let's see if I can bring it back up for you here again, where it would go out on the rollers and then out to the end of the tunnel go through a few more productions there, and then eventually drop down into one of the barges out there. So it's primarily been gravel. I think if, if you look at the history of the area, it has been the traditional land and refuge for the Stilicum peoples, the absolute longest history-wise. Since uh, the Honorable Judge Chambers took over the area, it has predominantly served as an industrial gravel mine providing rock concrete and cement for the greater Puget Sound area over all those hundred years. 
And then only recently was it turned into a massive recreational facility and huge time golf course. But looking back at the history of that, I think is pretty extraordinary. So if you have questions, please let me know. Uh, if, oh, see, thank you. It's called a drag line that they were using there. I knew someone, this is, I honestly host these tours just so that I can enrich my knowledge because there's always somebody that knows more than me about something. So I appreciate you guys chiming in when you do. Uh, we've got some more exciting stuff coming up here soon. The third Thursday of this month is going to be our Foss Waterway Seaport tour of Rum Runners and Smugglers in the Puget Sound. And we are pretty stoked to be doing that one. I can tell you right now, it will include footage of secret tunnels and some photos of a secret hatch that used to be used for Stuff I'm not going to tell you about until the third Thursday. So be excited, my friends. If you have enjoyed yourselves tonight, you can always tip your guide on the homepage of prettygrittytours.com. You've helped us keep the lights on through all this time, and I appreciate it. So with that, I will be releasing a new schedule of exciting stuff coming up for the summer months, but I'm going to be taking a week off here. So until next time, my friends, stay cool out there. Keep interested and keep on exploring. I'll see you all very soon. Thank you so much.